Hi, and welcome to Chris at the Movies, and an in-depth, behind-the-scenes look at the 1974 disaster movie, The Towering Inferno. The film was produced by Erwin Allen, featuring an ensemble cast led by Paul Newman and Steve McQueen. Directed by John Gilliman, the film is a co-production between 20th Century Fox and Warner Brothers. The first to be a joint venture by two major Hollywood studios. The film earned a nomination for the Academy Award for Best Picture and was the highest grossing film of 1974, premiering on December the 16th of that year. The picture was nominated for eight Oscars in all, winning three. In addition to McQueen and Newman, the cast included William Holden, Faye Dunaway, Fred Astaire, Susan Blakely, Richard Chamberlain, O.J. Simpson and other stars. Although famed for his dancing and singing in musical movies, Fred Astaire received his only Oscar nomination for this film. He also won both a BAFTA Award and Golden Globe Award for his performance. Steve McQueen, Paul Newman and William Holden all wanted top billing. Holden was refused his long-term standing as a box office draw, having been eclipsed by both McQueen and Newman. To provide dual top billing, the credits were arranged diagonally, with McQueen lower left and Newman upper right. Thus, each appeared to have first billing, depending on whether the credit was read left to right or top to bottom. This was the first time this staggered but equal billing was used in a movie, although it had been considered earlier for the same two actors regarding Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, until McQueen turned down the Sundance Kid role. Paul Newman and Steve McQueen were paid the same $1 million and 10% of the box office each. Principal photography took place over 14 weeks. It had a budget of $14 million and was one of the biggest grossing films of 1974 and made $116 million in the United States and Canada, and $203 million worldwide. It was adapted by Sterling Silifant from a pair of novels, The Tower by Richard Martin Stern, and The Glass Inferno by Thomas N. Scortier and Frank M. Robinson. Both novels were inspired by the construction of the World Trade Center in the early 1970s, and what could happen in a fire in a skyscraper. In Richard Martin Stern's novel, The Tower, the fictional 125-storey building, was set next to the North Tower of the World Trade Centre. In an interview given years after the film was released, writer Sterling Silifant said that he always sat under a sprinkler system head when visiting a building. He said he did that because he learned it from a fireman he interviewed while researching this project. At first, Erwin Allen did not want to use music during the first five minutes of the helicopter sequence at the beginning of the movie. But John Williams told Allen that he could come up with five minutes of music. When Allen heard it, he agreed with Williams. According to actress Susan Flannery, 20th Century Fox refused to let Erwin Allen direct all of the film. Allen directed all the action sequences and John Gilliman was hired only to direct the actors for non-action sequences. There were a total of four film units shooting at the same time. Catherine Ross, Raquel Welsh and Natalie Wood were all offered the role that was eventually played by Faye Dunaway. Wood declined because she was pregnant with her second child. She also found the script mediocre. During filming, an actual fire broke out on one of the sets and Steve McQueen found himself briefly helping real firemen put it out. One of the firemen not recognising McQueen said to the actor, My wife is not going to believe this, to which McQueen replied, Neither is mine. Also in his ride-alongs with the Los Angeles Fire Department, Steve McQueen actually took part in dousing a blaze. Against Erwin Allen's strenuous objections, 
McQueen insisted on doing the stunt where he leaps off a helicopter onto the top of the burning building. And Paul Newman did most of his own stunts, including climbing up and down the bent stairwell railing. Steve McQueen and Faye Dunaway left instructions that they should not be approached by visitors to the set. McQueen also refused to give interviews. Paul Newman asked only that he was not surprised. 1,000 real firefighters were hired throughout the entire production and 60 stunt people performed more than 200 stunts. Owen Allen originally wanted Steve McQueen to play the part of building architect Doug Roberts. McQueen, however, fought for and got the role of Fire Chief O'Halloran. The role of Doug Roberts went to Paul Newman. According to actor, stuntman, Ernie F. Osati, Faye Dunaway was often late to the set or didn't appear at all. This made some scenes impossible to film and caused other actors such as William Holden and Jennifer Jones to become quite upset. Holden reportedly shoved Dunaway against the wall one day and threatened her. For the next month, she had a perfect attendance record. Despite the alleged on-set clash between William Holden and Faye Dunaway, they would reunite two years later for Network. William Holden complained about his part, saying that he spent most of the time talking on the phone and later referred to the film as lousy. The film was nevertheless a massive worldwide box office hit and earned back nearly ten times its production cost. It also earned Paul Newman and Steve McQueen, who were later both critics of the film, a sizeable sum, as both were given a percentage of the box office gross. Industry rumours circulated that Jennifer Jones received the part once Olivia de Havilland had turned it down, due to the influence of Jones' husband, Norton Simon. Simon was a multi-millionaire and held a large amount of stock in 20th Century Fox, He also loaned several priceless Pablo Picasso paintings to the production for set decoration. Desperate to capture a truly surprised reaction from the cast, Erwin Allen actually fired a handgun into the ceiling without warning the actors, who were understandably surprised. The trick worked and he got his shot. Despite their supposed rivalry as Hollywood's leading man, Steve McQueen and Paul Newman actually got along reasonably well during production of this film. The supposed rivalry was apparently instigated several years earlier by McQueen, who was fiercely competitive in real life anyway. Newman had become an A-list film star several years before McQueen, and was actually five years older as well, and McQueen always felt he was playing catch-up to Newman in his career. The producers eventually decided to ask Newman to co-star, as not only was he also a box office draw, but they felt they might get McQueen to up his performance and less likely to he will act like a diva by considering it his movie. As it happened, both male leads and William Holden, despite considering the story derivative, behaved impeccably and were very professional. During the early morning process, of getting the scene ready for the exploding ceilings, water pipes bursting, fires burning and smoke billowing in, one of the special effects crew members, Gary L. King, was located on the set that was actually built on a platform about 10 feet above the soundstage floor level. To supply additional water, a 4-inch main water hose feeding to a manifold was rigged to do a rounded bend from the stage floor up onto the set level. As the high pressure of water was turned on, a weakened part of the hose suddenly burst the hose into a wild twisting and water spitting snake. Being close to the hose, Gary attempted to contain the hose with a large plastic trash barrel in order to prevent the water spray from hitting any of the film equipment, including cameras, lights and sound recording equipment, along with any film crew. As Gary battled for control of the busted hose, The crew scattered, leaving Gary alone in action. Suddenly, before the water pressure was shut off, Gary noticed someone helping him. When it was finally turned off, Gary heard the crew cheer and applaud, his and the helper's actions. Completely soaked, he turned around to thank his helper, 
who turned out to be none other than Steve McQueen. Both men being about the same size, McQueen told Gary to see his wardrobe assistant to get a dry set of clothes to work in. As a member of the special effects crew working on the film and personally involved in all of the scenes with the water falling from the exploding tanks above the party restaurant area, Gamiel King related that the special effects crew used a series of fire hoses connected to a quick action valve that when open squirted the water forward towards Paul Newman, Fred Astaire and Steve McQueen. The water was diverted by a plywood ramp located about 10 feet on the floor ahead of the actors. The deflector caused the water steam to go upwards and fall down on each actor. None of the actors were injured by the special effects rigging during any of those shots filmed. In the climax, Fred Astaire was not acting when the water tank explosions happened. They actually scared him. Steve McQueen took a four-year hiatus from acting after making this film. The Golden Gate Bridge is seen at the beginning of the movie when Paul Newman's helicopter flies over it. The establishing shot that includes a tribute to firefighters at the beginning of the movie is San Francisco City Hall. Exterior shots used the Bank of America building at 555 California Street. It was from the rooftop of the same building that psycho killer Scorpio took pot shots at San Francisco citizens in Dirty Harry. The main lobby in the tower was actually at the Hyatt Regency Hotel. It has been used in numerous movies including Time After Time, High Anxiety, Telephone and Freebie in the Bean. The mansion of snivelly cheapskate electrician Roger Simmons, Richard Chamberlain, is in the classy Pacific Heights district. This wealthy neighbourhood always seems to be a bit dubious on screen. 2930 was home to writer Catherine Trammell, Sharon Stone in Basic Instinct, while oily, ambitious politician charmers Robert Vaughan lived at 2700 in Bullet.
The fire station in the movie is near 2136 California Street, San Francisco. The buildings used in the film was a series of miniatures and matte paintings. Only sections of the building were actually constructed for the actors and stunt people to perform their scenes. It remained standing in the same location for many years, even after the state of California bought the land and opened the ranch to the public. Well guys, thanks for watching, and why not consider subscribing to the channel, as I have new videos coming out every week. I'll catch you guys later, enjoy your movies, bye!